worship you. I live, I live to worship you. That's it.
because of Jesus. And so when we look and observe the table that is set on today, we're grateful that when nothing else could help, when nothing else would work, when sin had us in his clutches, that Jesus, that he gave, that he sacrificed, that God loved us so much that he gave us the very best he had to offer in his son, Jesus. Let us not become broke. Let us not become comfortable. Let us not get ever too comfortable where we forget all that was done for us. And this is the thing, that the blood, over 2,000 years later, the blood is still working. On our behalf. Father, we say thank you. Father, we glorify you for your son, Jesus. Father, we thank you that you loved us so much, Father. That you gave us, Father, your son. Father, we worship you all today. For that name that is above every name. Yeah. And Father, this is what we know and what we understand. We have different issues. We have different circumstances. We have different problems that plague us, Father. But Father, your word says to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And so, Father, I pray that someone is edified, that someone is lifted, Father, that someone's life is changed through the preaching of this gospel of Jesus Christ so no one leaves remembering Adam's feet but they remember and worship the name that is above every name and so over every circumstance over every situation over every hill over every valley we speak the name we love you and we thank you in the matchless name of Jesus we pray let everyone that agree shout amen. 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 Now give God some praise. Amen. Because he is worthy of the praise on today. Uh, we continue um, in, in our series. We're, we're, we're working through a series uh, entitled Operating in Obedience. Um, and, and two Sundays ago, we looked at the price of obedience. Um, and so on today, um, I want to take a close look at the pitfall of disobedience. Um, and so if, if, if you will turn with me to the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 15. Um, and we will, we will look at the entire chapter, um, but as a point of reference, just for a launching point um, in terms of, of our aim on today. Um, We'll look closely at, at verse 22. And so, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 says this, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of the rams. Growing up as a boy, I, I had a label that was attached to me. For as long as I can remember, my mother would tell me and she would tell other people that I was strong-willed. This, this label, this being strong-willed, meant that I often did what it is that I wanted to, even if I was advised are told not to do it. And, and what my mother labeled as strong will would, would oftentimes be characterized as hard-headed to others. Meaning that if my mother left me with someone or with my grandmother on, on the weekend, it, it wasn't too far into the weekend where there was a conversation that was had that somebody, my grandmother or some family or some friend would remind my mother of how hard-headed I was. 
And then they deemed me hard headed because again, oftentimes I was doing the very thing that they instructed me not to do. But, but this was not only at, at, at home, this seemed to follow me um, even to the schoolyard. And so this, this behavior, and so many times, and we remember, um, it would be every few months or so, you would get a progress report or you would get a report card. And, and the major thing that would be looked for on your report card is they would give you a grade for, for your work, right? And so um, oftentimes there would be an A or, or, or a B, and I guess when I was really doing bad, I, I would stay somewhere right there with the C's because it was just good enough to get by. But, but over in the other area, if you remember, primarily, they would always have either uh, an E for excellent, an S for satisfactory, or a, a U for unsatisfactory. And so what the oddity was is while I was pretty much a good student, I can, I can get the A's and the B's and sometimes the C's. The, the oddity or the weird part is that when you got over to the other area where the behavior was looked at, it was the oddest thing. I could end up with an ASS. Y'all got to ignore that part, even though that's where I was acting, right? And so or I would end up with an AUU. And so then it was weird because on one end I could do the work, but when it came to my behavior in the remarks area, uh, I would say something to the effect does not follow directions. Well, the reality was I did what I wanted to do, when I wanted to do it, but then when my report card would come, I would have the nerve to be upset with my mother because oftentimes she would have to overlook the grades that I had made and the marks that I had earned with, 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 with my work. And it was sometimes as if my, my brain or, or, or my intelligence had not, had not caught up to my behavior. Does that make sense? And so while they would say, oh, he's gifted, and while they would say he does a good job in his work, and while I was winning all the spelling bees at school and across the city, I had an issue with my behavior. Right. And while my mother called it strong will, my grandmother might have called it hard headed. The truth was I was a disobedient child. Uh, it's Thomas A. Campus that says, instant obedience is the only kind of obedience there is. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Whoever strives to withdraw from obedience withdraws from grace. That is where we find ourselves. This is the tone of our text on today in 1 Samuel. What we find is that the prophet Samuel in, in this interaction has a stern words for King Saul. Because what we will see and what we understand is that King Saul has knowingly disobeyed the will of God. If we jump immediately to the text and in verses 1 through 3, we find this clear command from Samuel to Saul. Follow me. Uh, Samuel comes and says, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to my words. Watch, watch what the prophet tells him. He says, Thus says the Lord. I have noted that the Amalekites did to you in Israel in opposing them on the way when they came out of Egypt. Verse 3. Watch what God says. He says, Now go and strike the Amalekites and devote to destruction all they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man, woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. Watch this. The, the, the command is clear. What God has instructed through the prophet to, to, to Saul is this, that when you get, I, I remember what it is that, 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 that the uh, Amalekites did to you when you came out of Egypt. And so God has not, had not forgotten what it is how the Amalekites treated the Israelites when they were freed from Israel, okay? And so God had, that, had this chip on his shoulder, if you will, or this judgment that was deemed for them for 400 years. And to look deeper into the story, you can look on Exodus chapter 17. Um, but, 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 but God held this grudge against the Amalekites. They, they had attacked the Israelites on their way up. 
They had attacked them when they were weak and vulnerable. And so when God remembered what was supposed to come upon the Amalekites, and so now that Saul is commander, God says, I want you to go and attack the Amalekites. He says, watch this, and I want you to utterly destroy them. I want you to completely wipe them out. Man, woman, boy, animal, leave nothing. This is complete destruction. Watch this, that God has judged on these people. And so we get to Saul now has the command. We get to verses 4 through 6. And, and, and Saul begins to prepare, right? Saul begins to prepare um, and to go into what it is that God has called him to do. And the text teaches us in, in verses 4 through 6 that, that he takes 200, somewhere around 210 soldiers. And what they do is they position themselves in a ravine or they position themselves in, in a valley. But when they get to the valley, they notice that there's some other people living there. And so they're there to attack the Amalekites. But while they're there, they come in contact with the Kenites. Stay with me. Now, the Kenites, opposite of the Amalekites, had shown favor to the Israelites when they were coming about Egypt. And so God remembers this. And so when Saul sees the Kenites, he tells them, get out of here now. This is this pastor I've been talking. I'm going to give you a chance because if you stay here, I have to slaughter you along with everybody else. Are you with me? And, and, and so the text is clear that, 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 that the Kenites are now wrong. Saul and his 210 men are now down in the ravine. They are preparing to go and do what it is that, that God has told them to do, which is to go into the land of the Amalekites and utterly destroy them. This is the command. Stay with me that God has given to Saul. But as we get deeper into the story, somewhere around verses 7 to 9, it says that Saul and his men, they, they go from preparation, right, and positioning themselves to this act of war. And the text teaches us is that they go all the way from one end to the other, and they begin to, to, to slaughter, and they begin to kill, and they begin to do what it is that God had commanded them to do with the Amalekites. But there's a catch in the text. If you read in verses 7 through 9, that the Amalekites had a king named Agag. And so for some particular reason, Saul thought it was a good, a good thing to spare the life of the king. Stay with me. And so Saul decides, well, what we're going to do is we're going to spare the life of the king. Or you got to remember the first couple of verses. God says that when you go into the land, I need you to get rid of what? everything to utterly destroy. Well, this begins to put disobedience into practice. Stay with me. Because now that, 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 that Saul has become disobedient, watch what the people do. Watch what the text say his soldiers do. What they do is everything that's weak, everything that's feeble, everything that they cannot use, they decide to slaughter and kill it. But everything that was good, Everything that was fine, the best animals and whatever money and whatever was there that they considered good, they decided, well, we'll just take this for ourselves. We'll just keep this. And so here we are. They have gone through. They have slaughtered. But they have now kept what it is that they decided to keep. <laughs> Let me remind you on today that partial obedience is still disobedience. Right. Saul so, and his men, they have, they have gone in. They have from one side to the other, they have attacked, they have killed, and then they have taken the spoils and have taken with them what they wanted. And so they're done with that part. And, and, and in my mind, and in my spiritual mind, I can imagine that, 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 that Samuel, right, the prophet, he's laying into bed. And, and anyone who's ever had one of these interactions with God where he wakes you up in the midnight hour because he has something to say to you. And so I could imagine that the prophet Samuel is laying down and God begins to speak. God, when he speaks to the prophet in verses 10 through 11, God has strong words for the prophet in regards to the disobedience of Saul. Watch what God says. Verses 10 through 11 says, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. Hear me, God says, I regret that I even made him king. And God says, my, 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 my regret for him is that he's decided not to follow my commands. Watch what God is saying. I, I, I gave him something to do. I point blank made sure that I sent you to him to give him instruction on what it is that I would have him to do. And God uses these, these candid terms. God says, he's turned his back on my commands. Y'all come with me. 
y'all, y'all stay with me. Here we see the heart of God here, do we not? This is a candid view of how God views disobedience. And so we, what we find, watch, this is, this is what, this is what we, where we begin to see the, the human emotions that are now aligned to God, right? We call this anthropomorphism. And so this is when you begin to see God operate in human characteristics, but it's so that we can understand. And so the text says that God is operating in a place where he regrets that even making Saul king, but it's deeper than that. God is grieved to his heart over Saul being disobedient. And so this is what happens. Now this has shifted because Samuel is a prophet, because Samuel has a heart for God. The scripture teaches us that even Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. When he heard about what Saul had done, even the man of God, because he understood how angry, that's how intimately acquainted he is with God, that he can, when God is speaking to him, that he can hear God's displeasure, that he can hear God's heart. And so now now you have the prophet. Here we go. He's upset. He's angry. He's distraught. Watch this. He's grieving because God is grieving. What takes place is that the text teaches us in, in, in verse 12 that the prophet gets up early in the morning. Samuel gets up early in the morning and he begins to make his way to see King Saul. When he gets there to, to talk to King Saul, when, when he gets there to deal with Saul, Saul isn't in place. Let me put it this way. Saul isn't even home. That's right. I'm where Saul. Well, Saul was feeling so good about himself. Saul was so, was so prideful. Saul feeling so, so high and mighty. What the text teaches is that Saul went up and Saul began to build a monument to himself in his own honor. He had won the war. Things had gone well based on what he could understand. And so now he's somewhere basically building a statue or a monument, uh, honoring and giving his own self a celebration and a party for how well he thinks he has done. Oh, there's something about disobedience, is it not? There's something about when we operate in pride, when we when we operate in, in, in disobedience, that sometimes our hearts and our minds can be so warped that what's wrong looks right and what's right looks wrong, and that is the place that disobedience now has sought. And so once Samuel, once Samuel finds him, I need you to pay attention to the text. Because you can read the, the tone of the text and, and in verse 13, when, 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 when Saul sees the prophet, when, when Saul sees Samuel, watch how out of his head he is. He says, blessed be you, the Lord. Watch what he says. He says, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. What does that mean? When he sees him, he says, good morning, hey man, it's, it's, it's good to see you. Do you see this monument that I've built to himself? He says, matter of fact, if you want to ask me anything about what's been going on, I want you to know I've done everything that God has commanded me to do. Uh, the foolishness of Saul. Some writers say that his being quick to boast in his obedience was a clear sign that he knew that he hadn't done what God had commanded. And so I remember, I remember being a child, and on Saturdays we had to do uh, household chores. My mom would leave my sister, myself, as well as my brother home, um, and it was our responsibility to clean every area of the house. We were supposed to uh, do all the laundry. Well, my sister, from the time she woke up, she would always do what it is that she was supposed to do. And so me and my little brother, we thought, let's see, she left at nine. She probably won't be back till three. We got a little bit of time. It makes sense. And so we'll watch a couple of cartoons. We'll watch a little soul train. We'll go outside and play with the neighbors and do everything, wrestle around and just be boy. But the clock was still ticking. Does that make sense? And every now and then, every few hours, we would go and do one of our assignments or one of our chores that my mother had left. Well, all of a sudden, it'll be 3 o'clock, and, and, and she's there, and she's been out on Saturday, been witnessing or, or doing something at the church, and, and she shows up, and we would see her, and all of a sudden, we would have fear, right? And so I would run to my mom, and the first thing I would say to her, before she could even get in the door and put, put her purse down and, and grab something out of the refrigerator, I'd say, Mom, I cleaned that bathroom like you told me to do. And while I'm telling her that I'm in the bathroom, my brother is in the room, and he's trying to stuff all the stuff in the closet or the toy chest of what we didn't do while she was there. I was trying to distract her and tell her what I did right so she would not pay attention to what I did wrong. Does that make sense? That is the predicament that we find with, with Saul. Right? This is the thing. When you know you haven't done right. 
I mean, talk to me. When, when you know you get told uh, out of bounds. When, when you know it's, it's something in us that makes sure that we, that we go and we make sure that we tell people all the good about us, everything that we've done right, everything but, but Samuel knows, hear me. And so while Saul is celebrating himself, and while Saul is lying and believing through pride that he's done everything, watch the question that the prophet asks him. Samuel says, well, what's that bleeding of sheep? I hear in my ears. What's the low of oxen that I hear? Watch this. When God said destroy, the prophet could hear in the background. And, and, and so what happens is one commentator says, pride and disobedience makes us blind or deaf to our sin. What was completely obvious to Samuel was invisible to Saul. Pause right there. Stay right there. Have you guys ever seen the, 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 the Febreze commercial where the mother walks in the room um, with her child and he's in there playing video games and when she walks in the room, she can smell every stench, every dirt that he has not cleaned up. And when she asks about it, he can't even smell it. Why? Because he has been in this atmosphere and in his mess so long that he can't even notice the smell or the stench of his stinking room. Does that make sense? This is where we find Saul on this morning. This is what happens with disobedience. We get so comfortable being disobedient. We get so comfortable doing what it is that we want to do, even though we know what the Word of God says, even though we know what we were taught, that all of a sudden we don't even pay attention to the surrounding or what it looks like or our behavior. Stay with me. But the prophet hears. Say, well, I know I told you to kill all the sheep and all the oxen, so, so why do I hear them in the background? Stay with me. If, if, if you did everything that God told you to do and to slaughter the animals, why do I smell as the wind is shifting? Why do I smell the animals in the surrounding areas? Uh, Saul begins in the text to make excuses. Saul begins to, to justify his behavior. Uh, Samuel says, well, watch this, as he's as he's talking and, and, and he's giving excuses and he's saying everything that he did do and, and saying how he followed the commands of God. He did like my mom would do me on Saturday morning when I was telling her how I cleaned the bathroom and telling how sparkling and clean it was. She'll say to me sometimes, well, how about the room? And I get to stutter and saying, well, uh, when I tried to get to the room, you know, that CJ started playing outside and he started aggravating me and, and irritating me, mama. And I, I was supposed to, and all of a sudden, this is what she'll say. She'll say, shut up, I don't want to hear you. With me. In the text, Saul is giving excuses, and the prophet says, Be quiet so I can talk to you. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but, but God woke me up early last night, was, was dealing with me last night, and God told me about you, Saul. Follow me from verses 17 to 21. The prophet begins to read the charges against Saul. Verse 17 says, Though you are little in your own eyes and are not head of the tribes of Israel, the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go, devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Verse 19. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Watch Saul in verse 20. And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. He said, I, I, I went on a mission. He said, that, that the Lord sent me on. I didn't really want to go, but God told me to kill him. He said, I went where God told me to go. Watch what he says. He says, and I brought back Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And I have devoted the Amalekites to destruction. Watch what he says in verse 21. But the people took the spoil. The people took the sheep. The people took the oxen. The best of the things devoted to destruction to sacrifice the Lord your God in Gilgal. When he reads the charges, right? He begins to say everything that he did right. He says, and, and, and watch the end what he says. He says, and we brought back something to sacrifice to the Lord. We brought back something to dedicate to the Lord. Watch this. Uh, one writer says, it is a frequent human error to think that God will overlook and forgive all of one's sins so as long as one is careful to attend the church and offer sacrifices of hymns and praise. Right. 
And that's why we get to verse 22. And then and he begins to speak. And Samuel says, has the Lord as, as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fact of the realms. This is what he thought. He said, as long as I brought something back to, to, to sacrifice to God, as long as I brought an offering back, then God should be okay with what it is that I've done. I, I know I didn't do exactly what you told me to do, God. Now, this is some of us, but I showed up and I got paid on this weekend, and so I decided that I'd give you $150 of, of my $1,500 if you could just overlook everything else that I've been doing and how I've been living. Watch. I, 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 I know I haven't been doing everything right, but I go to buy Study. I, I come home Sunday morning. I, I, I feed the hungry. I do everything to make myself look good. And oftentimes we think that God ignores our disobedience and our behavior because we do one or two things right. Stay with me. Right. Say it's me. I thought because I did the work that my behavior would be overlooked in school. And so I have a question for somebody on this morning. Have you and I began to think that our sacrifices Giving us excuse to operate in disobedience. Have, 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 have we begin to, to think that we, 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 the work that we do, somehow the sacrifices that we make to God gives us the right to do what it is that we want to do when we want to do it. I've learned and I'm looking at my own life, so I'm not, I'm not talking about anybody. But, but this is the, it's the issue. As I explained my behavior in, in school as a child, I felt that my high marks in one area should excuse my disobedience in the other. Some of us like to pull out the scale, if you will, and we like to drop on each side all the things that we do good and that we do for God. And we get to drop on, on one side of the scale how long we've we been in the church. Because you know we're good for telling people how long we've been here. And, and we like to say how, how, how long we've been in this ministry. And, and, and at the end of the year, we like to pull out that piece of paper that we take to our tax person to show how much money that, that we've put in the church. And, and then on the other side, you say, but I know I messed up here, God. And what we often try to do is, is to balance out. Does that make sense? And, and to make and justify our wrong and to justify our disobedience with some of the sacrifices or some of the things that we do for God. Stay with me. Uh, but the goal is that you and I are so grateful for the grace of God that we pattern our lives in a manner that glorifies God. I'm going to say it again. The goal then is that, 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 that you and I then are so grateful for the grace of God, the unmerited favor, the fact that God didn't wipe us out when he could have and that when he should have, the fact that God gave his son for us and blessed us and we're alive today because of the love and because of the grace and the mercy of God that we are so overwhelmed with the goodness of God that we pattern our lives in a way that glorifies God. Uh, let me share with you then how you and I can, 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 can be different than Saul. How, how we can avoid the pitfalls of disobedience and operate in obedience. The first thing that, that, that if we want to operate in obedience to, to avoid the pitfalls, right? To, to avoid how it is that, that Saul was living, the first thing that we must do is number one, we must remain little in our own eyes. Remain little in our own eyes. Watch this. In 1 Samuel 9 and 21, Saw our answer, but am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And it is not uh, the smallest of the clan and the least of all the clans of Benjamin? Why do you say such a thing to me? And in, in this text, in, our, in Samuel, 1 Samuel 9 and 21, this is a picture of the heart of Saul. This is when God first called him as king. Watch how small he was in his own eyes. He began to tell the prophet where he was from and his small clan and how small. He didn't even think that God should choose him. To, he was small in his own eyes. He didn't even think that he deserved for God to bless him with such an honor of being king. If you read the text, it says that when the prophet was looking for him, he was kind of hiding out because that's how shy he was. That's how he felt about himself. Early in his life, what we find is that Saul was small in his own eyes. But if we fast, fast forward to our text for today, 
What do we find him in verse 12? We found him. How, how, how quickly he went from someone who was shy, who didn't think that he deserved the goodness and the grace of God and for God to even call him, that we find him in verse 12 of our text where he was building a monument and a statue of himself. He had a couple of good days. He had some people who said his name, started singing songs about him. He was a warrior. The Bible tells us that he was tall and that he was handsome and he had this flowing hair. And all of a sudden, between chapters 9 and 15, we find Saul is filling himself. He went from being small in his own eyes to big in his own eyes and telling everybody how good he was that he would build a monument to himself. He goes from viewing himself in low estate to clearly taking credit for the victory and what has been accomplished. And with me, this is all while knowing he has operated in disobedience. Here in church, disobedience is a sign of spiritual weakness. And when we begin to break down spiritually, I believe it warps our heart and our minds. We begin to get puffed up. Ain't nobody going to talk to me. We, 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 we do what we believe is right in our own eyes. And then we take God's commands, watch this, as suggestions are optional. This is what we do. We, 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 we read one scripture uh, and, and just read one line and read, read one verse and we don't read all of it and we decide that we're going to take this one verse or this one piece that we like and we're going to apply it to our lives and this is how I'm going to structure my life instead of looking at the whole command and what it is that we know God has instructed us to do. Uh, but if you and I are going to operate in obedience, here's the key. We must keep a high view of God and a low and humble view of ourselves. Pride is a sin, church. And Proverbs 16 and 18 reminds us that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That was the first mistake that Saul made. He was no longer little in his own eyes. He no longer had a high view in what it is that God had to say. And so if you and I want to operate in obedience, the first thing is that we must Remain there on our own eyes. But secondly, watch this. We must keep our reverence for God above our fear of people. I'll say it again. We must keep our reverence for God above our fear of people. Now what we see is that Saul, when, when, when Samuel comes to him, he immediately begins to blame the people in verse 15. Stay with me. However, the command was given to Saul by the prophet from God. Saul is the commander and the one whom God has instructed. Saul is the one who was told what it is that God desired from him. Then in verse 24, he says, I have sinned and transgressed because I feared the people. Again, watch this. He says his disobedience was motivated by who? By the people. Uh, let me ask you, how much are you and I allowing the voice of others to cause us to walk in disobedience. All right. uh, and, and, and for the sake of clarity on this morning, others can be family as well. Others can be your spouse. Others can be your boyfriend or girlfriend. Others can even be your children. Others can be your mama and your daddy. Does that make sense? Because, because what we understand is, is, is that God can speak something to us. We can be on our face. We can know exactly what it is that God has commanded you and I to do, how he wants us to do live, what he wants us to do and or abstain from, or what it is and how he's told us to structure and to formulate our lives so that we would be blessed. But oftentimes we let others and we let people and we let the kids and we let the spouse and, and even as leaders and pastors, pastors in the church, we let the people dictate what it is that we do. And so oftentimes in, in, in us trying to appease or please other people, we ignore the voice of God. Does that make sense? And so that's what Saul is saying. He's saying, well, 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 I, I know I sinned and I know I messed up, but it's because of what they said. It was, I was so worried about how they were going to feel, God, that I didn't listen to you. Stay with me. This reminds me of Proverbs. Proverbs is basically dictates that as you and I walk through this life, we got folly in one window, we got foolishness in one window, we got wisdom in the other, and both of us are speaking to us and telling us how we ought to live and telling us where we ought to go and telling us how we ought to structure our life. But the question is, which voice will we heed? 
When we do what it is that, that, that God has commanded us to do, will, will we follow the path of wisdom or, or will we go down the foolish route knowing good and well that it's not what God told us to do? And like Saul, when we find ourselves in the pit, when we find ourselves in a mess, we want to blame mama, daddy, grandma, the kids, and everybody else. But the reality is, is that I'm the one that God spoke to. I'm the one that God told. I knew very well clear what it is that God has commanded me to do and so when I decide to go left, I cannot put the blame on anybody else but who? But myself. But we understand this. Watch this. When we revere God more than we fear evil. Hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard in this world, ain't it? It's hard on the job sometimes when you reveal what it is that God says over what it is that the world is doing. I'm almost done. Uh, but not only must we remain smart in our own eyes, not only must we revere God above people, but watch this, our worship must remain authentic. What do you mean, that's right. Well, in verse 15, when he gets caught, he says, I took it so we can make a sacrifice Watch what he tells Samuel. He says, to your God. Say with me. Then in verse 21, he says, we did what we did so we can make a sacrifice to the Lord, your God. Y'all, y'all, y'all stay with me. But when he's completely up against the wall in verse 25, he says, well, can you please come back to me so we can worship the Lord? He said, he says, take me back to the people, but watch, watch what he's concerned about. What, what, what Samuel tells him is that God regrets that he ever made you king. That God sees that you've been disobedient. That God wants nothing to do with you. That God is getting ready to strip you down. That God is getting ready to take everything from you. And watch, in the beginning, when he was saying everything, he said, I did this so I could sacrifice to your God, right? And, and, and I'm doing this as a favor to your God. Don't, don't act like that and like we treat God like he owes us a favor sometimes for everything that we do in the church. And oftentimes, our worship is not authentic. We just do what it is that we think we're supposed to do, be doing because it looks right and it's churchy and we think God will be pleased with the little bit that we give. But watch this, when he found himself in a situation where God was stripping him and taking everything from him, all of a sudden he went from Samuel's Lord to his Lord, and all of a sudden he wanted him to worship and to go back with him. That is when our worship is not authentic. We see it all the time. It's not until life gets bad that all of a sudden God is worthy of the praise. It, it, it ain't until the bottom fall out that, that all of a sudden Sunday is open on your schedule. It's, 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 it's not until the money gets funny that we decide, I guess I can start offering and, and pay us. It's not until, watch. The worship was authentic. The text proves it. He started building something to himself when he knows good and well God was the one that gave him the strength to win the battle in the first place. But we get puffed out. Oh, we don't tell nobody, but it becomes about us. And we begin to like when people say our names. And, and we begin to like when they call us out and say what board we on. And then we like when, when we're the person that everybody goes to. And we like when we're the ones with the gifts and we're the ones and the talent. And we begin to think that we make this thing go, that we make this church run. If they didn't have me, if I wasn't there, this church, this ministry wouldn't be nothing. And then so our worship is not really real because we come in here and we worship ourselves. Oh, I know. That's why we come in here and sit down and say, I don't feel lighter today. I got a headache today. It don't take all that today. But as soon as it get bad, oh God, is worth it. Now you feel like running. Now you feel like dancing. Now you feel like shouting. Watch this. The way to avoid it in the first place is when our worship is authentic. Hear me. When every day you remember when God took you from nothing to the place you are today. When, 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 when sometimes you got to go back in your mind and then remember those prayers and remember when you were crying out and remember it when you were all by yourself and remember it when mama couldn't figure out and remember when daddy wasn't nowhere to be found and remember before you had the kids and remember before you had that husband or a wife and you think it's fine and do everything. You got to remember where you was when it wasn't nobody but you and God and you would cry out and you would worship and you would sing and you would praise and you had time for him. I'm almost done. Sad to say that the Bible teaches 
uh, that our ministry took his anointing and took the kingdom away from Saul. And he found someone who had a heart for him. And that man, we know him, ultimately be David. Now watch this. David wasn't perfect, and we'll get into this on next week's part of, of, of the lesson, but he had a heart for God. So I asked, what is the condition of our hearts on this morning, church? Isaiah 29 and 13 says, the Lord says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based merely on human rules they have been taught. Do we honor him just with our lips? Do we honor him because we just know how to act churchy? And we want to put on the right club. When, when, when we come to the table, is it because we've been, been doing this on first Sunday for so long that we know how to call it out? We don't even need the hymn know anymore when we get it to that point. Do, is that the point that we are where we can do the affirmation of faith and then we can read the scriptures and before the preacher even get this text, you say, I know. Is that the point where we are where we fashion this thing out, where we do it in a rote way because we just know how to act in church or when we come in, is our heart in our worship? Is our heart part of our relationship with God? Matthew 15 and 8 says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Watch this. The key to living an obedient life is to keep your heart tangled and tied up into God. Because we mess up. Hear me, Saul ain't by yourself. When we read this, we can find some Saul in us, can we not? The times where God told us one way and we went the other way. But, but, but the thing that we need to get to is that when your heart is conditioned, when, when you love God with everything that you have, when you, when you realize what it is that God has done for you, when your life's only goal is to please God in every way, even when you mess up, we don't do as Saul do and make excuses. We begin to cry out. I, I don't need to apologize to you and to anybody else. I don't need to sit on the altar and explain what I've done wrong. It's when I understand that I have not pleased God, when I have sinned against God, when God is not pleased with me, that that our heart begins to ache, that we have to come in and we can't even contain the tears because no, nobody knows what I did last night. Nobody knows what I said last night. No one may know that I operated. I can come in here and act churchy, but I know in just the weight of understanding that I have grieved God with my disobedience and living my life in such a way that God might not be pleased with me is when we know that our heart is in it and our heart lines up and everything that comes out of our mouth is because it flows from our heart. No, it's not, church. And when I say God is good and God is good all the time, that's coming from my heart because I've seen him work. When I say that God is a provider and I know that he's Jehovah Jireh, that ain't because I know any other languages. That's because I know that God has provided for me. When I say that God is a healer because I've, I've seen him heal and I've seen him touch the lives of people. I've seen what he can do. When I say that God is Shalom, that's because I've seen him bring peace over my life. That flows from my heart, and that's how my mouth opens, and that's how it should be. Oh, oh, the choir sings sometimes. He said, I love you, yeah. Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you that I love you more than anything. Even when we mess up, here we couldn't go mess up. When we fought, it should be. God, I love you more than my mess. Yes, yes. I love you more than my sin. I love you more than my struggles. I love you more than my hiccups. I love you more than my inclinations. I love you more than the stuff that pops in my mind sometimes. God, I love you more than anything. Hear me? We begin to cry out. So God, I worship and adore you. Father, thank you for loving me. Yes. Father, thank you for your kindness. Father, thank you that your mercies are brand new every morning. Father, thank you for your compassion that you did not consume me. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus that's still working in my life. Father, thank you for redeeming me. Father, thank you for justifying me. Father, thank you for saving me. Father, thank you that while I'm trying to get this thing right, that grace and mercy and in goodness is following me every day of my life, Father. That's where our hearts should be, God. I'm, I'm trying to get this thing right, God. I'm trying to get this thing together, God. I want to do everything that you've commanded me to do. Father, send your Holy Spirit to give me the strength to walk, Father, and to talk and to be the person that you have come. Me. That should be our heart song. 
but we gotta make it little in our own eyes. We gotta revere God more than we fear Him. Lastly, our worship has to be authentic. And even in the midst of our mess, we find our way to the Savior. And it ain't so, hear me, I'm done. Because this is the problem. Some approach God so the mess gets right. You just want the mess to go away. Mm. When it gets to the point that you come to Him, because you want Him to get you right. Yes, yes, yes. Forget the mess. If you clean me up, I won't have the mess no more. So we're like that, creating me a clean heart, renewing me with the right spirit, yeah, yeah. purge me with his son, yes. that I may be whiter than snow. The word of God for the people of God. To God be the glory.
that you have in heart. You have some form of the elements. Today we remember what it is that was done for us. And the sacrifice. Sins, nor love and share you with your neighbors, and intense lead a new life, following the commandments of God, and walking from henceforth in his holy ways. Draw near with faith, and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, and make your humble confession to Almighty God by meeting and kneeling upon your knees. Your confession says, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men. We acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which you from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do honestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, said, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may hereafter serve and please thee in the newness of life, to the honor and glory of thy name, to Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We do not presume to come to this thy table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs from under thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful souls and bodies may be made clean by his death and washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Pray of consecration. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy didst give thy only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby his oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction of the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, that we may humbly beseech thee, and grant that we may receive in these our creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread of them. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for me, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you should drink it, in the remembrance of me. Amen. The Lord's Prayer.
Thank you. 